Okay, so you've finished Vampire Survivors. You've unlocked all the in-game achievements, got access to all the characters you want, you've beaten up the Grim Reaper and met the White Hand, you've probably had toons reach stupidly high levels and tried out the best weapon combos you can come up with. Are there any challenges left? If this is where you're at in the game, then this video might just be for you. The question is, can you become literally invincible? Not just stupidly, insanely, ridiculously strong. That's relatively easy in this game, in the scheme of things. But can you become actually immortal? Well, yes. Actually, yes you can. And this video is going to be a bit of a how-to guide for exactly how to accomplish just that. We've jumped straight in as I'm going to show you the whole run, where to go here, while I cover all the details of what's happening and why it all works. So, as you've probably already noticed, we're playing Porter, not for his lightning, that's completely irrelevant for this, but for the reduced cooldown bonus he gets at levels 1 and 2. For our power-ups, we've chosen everything except Magnet, Growth and Curse. These choices aren't strictly necessary, but will make things a lot easier for our run. We're playing with the Hyper and Arcana's options chosen. Again, not technically needed, but three extra revivals from the Awake Arcana and some faster movement from the Hyper helps make things just that little easier for us again. We're in the library, as this is the map where you can get the most empty tomes to spawn. In theory, you could attempt this run on any map with an empty tome, but more is better for this run. And as you might have seen, this run I had four tomes spawn, which I believe is maximum. Lastly, we leveled up to level two straight away and we chose the Laurel. This one isn't optional. If you don't get a Laurel as your first level up, then the Immortal run is bricked and you'll have to completely start all over to try again. Okay, having got a laurel, we then ran over to the shopkeeper and purchased the bone weapon. Strictly speaking, this is a gain, not 100% necessary, but of all the optional things I've mentioned so far, this is the one that will make your life the easiest of attempting this yourself. It does cost a thousand gold each time, but this isn't a game where coins are too hard to come by, so while the choice is yours, I do recommend making the splurge of trying this yourself. As you can see, I'm being fairly careful to avoid as many gem pickups as I can. A few is fine, but if Porter hits level 3, the cooldown bonus we've chosen for will disappear and the run will once again be bricked and will be time for another restart. Don't go too far out of your way to avoid gems though, as it is a bit of a juggling act. Ideally, we want to have picked up all four empty tomes while the monsters on the map are still relatively weak. And while that gives us a little bit of leeway time-wise, it's not an insubstantial distance that we have to travel. I would say you've got three minutes to get the four tomes. Any longer than that, and you risk finding yourself out of position and swamped by skeletons. Or worse. There's the second tome pickup at the 2.15 mark, which is just about right. Should be able to get the fourth tome just in time if all goes well. I've done this run a few times now, so pretty familiar with the timing of it. I should also mention, just then, that was pretty poor play by me. I hit a candelabra and picked up the floor chicken that fell out of it. Nothing bad happened, but if it hadn't been health and was instead one of those vacuum up all the XP items, there would have been no way to avoid levelling up, and it would have been necessary to restart all over again. Not the biggest mistake in the world to make, and there is a fair bit to keep track of, but it certainly could have gone poorly. So yeah, to maximise your own chances of being successful, don't do what I just did. Avoid blindly running into candelabras, just in case. Quick check of the map then, trying to ensure that I don't encounter the wizard cloak boss thing that I mentioned at the end of my last Vampire Survivors video. There's one guarding the cloak item that's located between the third and fourth empty tomes, and it's a real pain to fight if it spots you. You only have to stick to the bottom of the screen for a bit to bypass it, but yeah, I've mucked up and headed upwards too soon a couple of times in the past, so possibly a little paranoid now of him, I guess. Just playing it extra carefully. Okay, parking in the middle of the screen and trying to clear myself a bit of a fight zone for if I need it now. This tactic will be familiar to anyone that tried to unlock the Red Death character in previous patches of the game. We're exploiting the fact that there can only be so many XP gems in an area at any one time. After the maximum number is reached, a red gem will spawn and any future kills won't drop new gems but will instead add to the XP of that single red gem. Ideally we'd like to clear out the whole middle section of the screen here so we can run up and down at will when fighting bosses, allowing us to get their chests without risk of XP, which is needed for our plan to work. If you can't clear a decent fight zone though, and knowing how this run goes, I can tell you in advance that I failed to do so here, don't stress. The run's not over, it'll just be a tad more difficult. For our invincible plan to work, we only need enough chests to get our laurel to level 6. Anything more than that is just a bonus. Which is why I'm not too fussed about that first boss chest currently sitting there trying to taunt me. In a perfect run we would have got that, it would have been a laurel, and we'd be one step closer to our plan succeeding, but there are going to be plenty more bosses dropping chests before we reach the 30 minute mark. It's one thing we've actually got quite a lot of leeway with doing things this way. We could miss out on a half dozen boss chests or more by the end and still comfortably reach our goal.
So, my tune's not doing much for a bit. Time to cover exactly what it is we're doing here and why it can make us invincible. So the first thing to note in Vampire Survivors is that cooldown reduction is capped at 90%. Porter actually starts at level 1 with 90%, but this drops to 60% at level 2. We're combating that drop-off with the empty tomes. So, why are we after so much cooldown reduction? The one thing that affects the Laurel is cooldown reduction. At level 6 it has two charges. Normally when hit, one charge would be expended to make us immune to damage for a brief time, and it would take a while for this charge to become active again. If we got hit enough and both charges were used up, we'd become vulnerable for a time. However, with maximum cooldown reduction, the time it takes to recharge this spent charge is shorter than the time that we're invulnerable. So no matter what the situation, we'll either be invulnerable or have a charge ready to go. This means that while our damage will be low, level 2 and all, nothing, no amount of damage, not even a flock of Grim Reapers, will be able to get through us. Yes, in theory the White Hand could kill us by setting our health to zero, but as we're not actually getting the Lancet and evolving it into the Infinite Corridor this run, the White Hand won't be spawning at all. We can just sit back indefinitely, as long as we feel like it, killing off Grim Reapers at our leisure. So while I was talking then, my guy actually picked up his first boss chest and got a laurel, which was nice. But as you can see, I'm now starting to cut it a little bit fine on the XP front. Really not wanting to risk getting any more XP, I'm seriously looking at giving up on the plan of having a nice central fight area that's clear of gems, and instead slowly starting to inch towards my backup plan, which is a spot just behind that table uh, north of me. By hiding up there, while some bosses will almost certainly drop their chests out of my reach, some of them will also drop their chests directly on top of me. That's not exactly ideal, which is why at this point I'm desperately still trying to keep my options open. But yeah, I'm definitely making sure I can dash to behind the table at the first sight of anything even slightly going wrong now. This is certainly not the smoothest run of this that's possible. The reason above the table is my safe spot for fighting, by the way, is because of the way bouncing weapons like Bones and the Cherry Bomb work. As they're not limited by the number of times they bounce, but instead by their duration, if you fire one in a confined space, it can almost be like it's stuck there. As any creature that encounters one gets knocked back a little, if we can orchestrate it so that there's a bone, or more preferably a bunch of bones, bouncing pretty much on top of us, it can really defend us quite well, potentially buying us enough time to get our invincibility trick up and happening. We're essentially trading in our long-term maneuverability for some short-term survivability. It's not 100% ideal, but you could do this run a thousand times and still not get everything to go perfectly for you. I guess that's like any game though. At the end of the day, even the most perfect plan still requires you to be able to adapt it on the go based on what's happening to you on screen. Okay, so as you can see, I've finally taken the coward's option, feeling like I was only one unlucky mob off being forced to level 3. With the number of beasties starting to climb, I've retreated to the relative safety of my little alcove. You can see the stream of bones, which for now are killing most enemies before they get on top of me. Combined with the XP gems already lying around in sight, I feel I'd be pretty unlucky if I didn't move and was given any more XP at this point. Although I will admit that at this stage, just over 7 minutes into the run and already having retreated, I certainly wasn't expecting it to be successful. I've had some much more impressive starts where I had fight zones clear of gems, had less XP towards level 3, already picked up the first boss chest, etc etc. I wasn't anticipating this would be an attempt where I made it. But that's actually one of the reasons I chose this run to make a video with, to show that things don't have to go perfectly, or even close, to be able to do it. So, if you look in that crowd of critters there, you'll see the 8 minute boss hanging around with them now. He's the green blob that's slightly bigger than the rest of the green blobs. I would have preferred him to approach from the side and be pushed up and over the bookshelves like a few of his friends are from time to time, but it wasn't to be, unfortunately. With the pushback of the bones and my positioning, and the angle he's trying to come at me from, I can be pretty sure his chest is going to drop somewhere awkward. In fact, there it goes now. Ah oh, well, plenty more bosses where that came from. It's actually dropped in not the worst spot ever. It is possible I could potentially sneak around the tables, pick it up and make it back, all without walking over any XP gems, but as it's not guaranteed by any stretch, my guy's just going to stay put. He can always try doing that if we get near the end of the run and really, really need just one more chest. That's not going anywhere in the meantime. So, I referred to that last boss as the 8 minute boss. For those that aren't aware, boss spawns and vampire survivors aren't based on the number of kills like some other similar games, they're based purely on the clock count at the top. That's not super important to know which boss is coming when, that's arguably not even remotely important. After all, knowing won't change anything, they'll still arrive on queue no matter what. But there are times when it can help to know what's about to come. Maybe you're in a similar situation to my guy here where there's a chest in sight, 
maybe time's running out, you've got no revives, and you want to know, is it safe to make the dash, or is a boss about to spawn and start laying into me? Okay, so it's not the most common of situations, but still, occasions do crop up from time to time where the knowledge can be at least a little helpful. So with that in mind, for those that are interested, and while my guy is just chilling behind his bone wall here, I'm going to try listing the library bosses for you. So, there's the ones we've had already, the 3 and 5 minute mud men bosses, and the 8 minute green blob. Coming up will be the 10 minute spoky wheel guy. Then, there are the bats with the blue outline at the 11 and 12 minute mark. The last mud man at 13. The first Medusa at 15. There's another bat at 16. A witch at 18. There's the big green demon guy at 20. Two more bats at 21 and 22. Another spoky wheel guy at 23. The big walking witch boss at 25. She can really soak a hit or two. Uh, then I think it's Medusa's till the end with one at 26, 27 and 28. I think that's it. Apologies if I missed any. In fact, if I did, feel free to let me know below. But yeah, they're the ones that stand out in my mind anyway. Again, not at all necessary to remember. And really, if you can recall them even half as well as that, then maybe you've been playing too much of this game and it's time to take a break, eh? Okay? So, looks like we won't be getting the chest from the first Spooky Wheel boss. If you look closely there where it dropped, it's sitting almost directly on top of an XP gem. Still, this is the price we pay for hiding away in our little Elko. It won't be the last chest that drops in an awkward spot, but fingers crossed the next few will be better. For those that are watching this the whole way through and haven't already skipped to the end, I feel I should mention that this run definitely wasn't my idea. The concept of an immortal portal run has been around for nearly as long as the game has been out. The only difference is that with this new patch, the shopkeeper sells bones, and that takes the run from a theoretical possibility to something which is relatively easy to achieve in the scheme of things. You can see the work the Bones are doing here. Without them and the safety they provide, and without the extra three revives from Arcanas, you would pretty much have to get five laurels out of the first three boss chests. Any less than that, and you'd really struggle with the creatures that started being thrown at you. In fact, the best approach I found used to be to stay at level one so that you could keep max cooldown on your lightning, as it was your only weapon, clear out an early fight zone, and let the first three boss chests build up, then level up to level two and grab them all in quick succession. As Laurel is a fairly rare level up option in the scheme of things, this would mean that there would be a lot of extra wasted time per failed attempt, as you could spend maybe 10 minutes playing only to find out that you didn't even get Laurel as your level up choice. I did try it a few times in the past, okay, possibly more than a few times, but yeah, the closest I ever got was three Laurels out of the first two chests. I was pretty excited to open up the third chest at that time, hoping for another triple, or maybe even a quintuple chest, but it was just a lightning level, followed by me quickly being overwhelmed and dying. After that, I wasn't super keen to keep trying as I'd already put in more than a few hours into just getting to the point where I had that small shot at being successful. I'm actually not sure if anyone ever managed to do the Immortal Porter Run free shopkeeper, actually. I've seen some talk of a streamer or two doing it the way I'm doing it at the moment in the current patch, which isn't too surprising. But yeah, if anyone ever manages to do it pre-patch or even just without the shopkeeper and arcanas being used, then yeah, I tip my hat to their superior vampire survivor skills. This is also not the only way to get immortality happening as well. It is the original method, but there are definitely others. You could do it purely with golden eggs if you liked. For those that haven't tried the new patch, golden eggs drop off certain beasties, one off each of the four new bosses per map, I think you get five for killing death with the infinite corridor evolution, you can buy one off the shopkeeper. There may be more ways, but that's at least 10 a run you can get if you're after them. They give small bonuses to your character that persist through future games, and they stack indefinitely. When I discovered that, one, they stack indefinitely, and two, you can't toggle them off at will, I actually stopped collecting them completely. For me, they kind of ruin the game, actually. I don't want characters of mine to start with maximum everything and stats through the roof. For me, a lot of the fun is in starting at the bottom and getting to the top. Though is there a judgement to anyone where eggs are their thing. There is a lot of online speculation that within the next patch or two they'll introduce a way to toggle eggs on or off, and personally I'd love that, but until then, yeah, I've decided no eggs for me, which you can see if you go back and check the start of this vid, or maybe if you were particularly eagle-eyed and noticed it earlier I guess, but this is very deliberately a no egg Immortal Portal run. So while I was talking there, a couple more chests have dropped. 
That one on my left, I might be able to grab safely, but the screen's pretty crowded at the moment, which makes it hard to be positive there's not a stray XP gem hidden in there as well. Also, with the screen so crowded, if I did move, I'd risk the bones not bouncing the right way and my health starting to drop like a stone. For eager, it's best in this kind of situation to sit tight and only dash for the chest later if it becomes absolutely necessary, or if we feel it's become completely safe to do so. Still plenty of bosses left to go, and again, still not impossible they all just die right on top of me and give me their chests without me risking anything. So yeah, for now, staying still, totally the plan. Okay, here we go, coming up on the 15 minutes, or halfway mark, which means we get our first Medusa. There she is now, even. I don't know if it's just some confirmation bias on my part, but I have noticed a tendency for the Medusas to find their way up and over the bookshelves much more than any of the other boss types when I'm hiding in my little alcove, which, if true, would mean that they've got a much higher chance of dropping their chest right on top of me. That's because above me is a kind of out-of-bounds area. Just because beasties can attack us from there, no XP gems or chests can drop there. If they could, we'd be unable to get them at all, which would be pretty weak. So instead, the game pushes the rewards back down to where they can be picked up from, and the first spot that's legal happens to be just where we're standing. Looks like it's just another lightning level up this time, unfortunately, so no luck there. But that chest without moving did come from a Medusa, so there's that idea being reinforced in my mind even more now. Now it's out there, I'd be curious how many people watching this start noticing it as well. Or maybe it's actually a thing that people have already noticed in the past, and it's not just me imagining things. That'd be nice. I really don't know which is more likely, actually. So far, I've mentioned a few things that they've changed with this latest patch. There's the eggs, the arcanas and the shopkeeper. I touched on the four new wizard cloak boss things guarding new items you can pick up in maps, which can be used to get the infinite corridor weapon evolution. You can watch my other vampire survivor video if you want details on that and how to get them to spawn. But I haven't mentioned my favorite addition in this new patch yet. All the new playable characters have added. Maybe you've already found them all, in which case, very nicely done, but maybe you've only found the ones in coffins or some such and didn't look any further. If that's the case, then yeah, there's many more left for you to discover. Probably the most enjoyable one to unlock in my mind was later, if that's the way to pronounce it. For those unaware, he, or she, it, can be found by heading south in the Gallo Tower level. If you go south far enough, and it is quite a ways, the map will start getting darker and darker. Go far enough into the dark, and yeah, later will be there as a boss that you can fight, win, and you can play the character on future runs. Okay, admittedly not super well hidden for those that like to explore, but like I said, fun. For an example of a more well hidden one, there's the unlock that I managed to miss when trying to search them all out myself. I only managed to find out about it by looking stuff up online. So. If you've collected 100 floor chickens, which I'm guessing almost everyone watching this vid already has, then you want to play on the Mad Forest level. If you get or discard both the Scalomaniac and Pumarola, which you can pick up off the ground, pies will start to drop on the ground in a certain part of the map. Pick up and follow the Chain of Pies and they'll lead you to Murabio, another fight to unlock boss type fight. Easy to miss, at least in my mind, and yeah, something which encourages me to look a lot more carefully for other hidden things in the game actually. And if you're sitting there going, haha, silly person, why not just look things up on Wiki? Well, have I got news for you. I can think of at least a half dozen games off the top of my head that I've played over the years where the Wiki has been woefully far from complete on such things. There are often plenty of secrets and hidden things that you would completely miss if basing your knowledge purely off Wikipedia. Remember, game wikis are more often than not written by the players, not the game designers. So yeah, as such, they can have some pretty substantial holes in them sometimes. There's a reason you can't reference Wikipedia in academia. It is a useful reference, but far from being a guaranteed complete one. So there's a question that those still watching may have if they don't know the ins and outs of the game's mechanics. How are my weapons still managing to kill mobs at a decent rate here despite them not being leveled? Okay, so there's clearly a lot of bones in a small space, but those purple guys aren't a joke in the scheme of things, and there are still plenty going down to my extremely low level lightning bolts well before they reach my bone wall. So this has to do with the way beasties scale in the game. You may be aware that the Grim Reaper's hit point scales so that he spawns able to soak 655,350 times, to be exact, the player's level in damage. And that means if you're around level 150, by the way, not an unusual level to reach in a proper run, Reapers will be spawning with almost 100 million hit points. 
But normal beasties work the same way as well, just with much less of a multiplier. Theoretically, if you're not playing with a character like Zia Sunto that has an open-ended version of the Omni pickup as their innate power and whose damage keeps scaling as they level, it might be possible to reach such a high level that damage from even fully evolved weapons started to become almost negligible, as many have a set cap to their output. But realistically, there's access to weapons like the Gorgeous Moon, which is the evolved pentagram that just outright kills critters, not to mention you only get 30 minutes to run to actually get XP, which makes obtaining crazily high levels pretty tough. I know I've clocked level 200 in a few runs with some time to spare before, but I've no idea what kind of level records have been reached out there on internet land. Personally, I enjoy focusing on something slightly different when playing normally. I like seeing what level I can get to where it's still giving me skill choices. So for example, the Peach One and Ebony Wings combined to make the Vandalier, the Fiera de Tofello and the Eight Sparrow combined to make the Fioragi, and the Vento Sacro and the Evolved Whip combined to make the uh, Fuala Fualu. And yes, I believe that is how it's pronounced. Uh, this then leaves three weapon slots still free, throw an infinite corridor on a crimson shroud into a mix, there's a bunch more levels, and if you play on a level like the dairy plant where there's a bunch of passive item pickups just lying around, you can choose five that aren't lying around as level ups first, then pick up all the armor and wings type stuff that you can, not to mention the rings and metaglio cloaks that you can pick up as well now, you can easily start a third row of passive items uh, that need leveling on your character. All that combined, and it's very easy to still be choosing skill up options well past level 150. It doesn't actually do anything. I mean, my tune doesn't necessarily come out any tougher than someone's that's chosen to focus on some kind of synergy, say, I don't know, choosing all crit and projectile weapons and then focusing just on high crit and extra projectiles. That's just something I found I enjoyed while playing. It might be that I find 100 plus levels where I'm given the choice of only coins or floor chickens a bit dull, but yeah, I like it. Though it has distracted me from going for a highest possible level run to date, as such a run would take some careful pre-planning and a very different weapon setup. Probably starting with an evolved pentagram as quickly as possible, then getting huge AoE while you work on an early infinite corridor. I'm not sure, that's just off the top of my head, but I'll work out the details and give it a shot at some point down the track. Though if I do, I promise I won't stick up a run of the whole video next time. I didn't quite realise when I started to make this one just how much 30 minutes of talking while my guy stands around just in an alcove would be. It goes by a whole lot faster when you're playing. Although if you look carefully, stuff is slowly starting to happen now. You may have noticed my guy starting to get a little bit twitchy, taking a step here, a step there. So this is because I'm only level 3 Laurel at the moment and we're running out of time. Yes, there's still more than 8 minutes left, but at the 22 minute mark there'll be hordes of purple guys, followed by the big bats, then medusas. This is pretty much the last chance we get to move around even remotely freely before the reapers. So yeah, figured to make it, I should have at least a level 4 at this point, so no better time to try for one of the close chests. And managed to find a laurel straight away, which is extremely nice. Takes us to level 4, which I'm comfortable with at this stage. Should keep us going for a while, so straight back to the safety of our spot it is. There were two other chests there that I also considered going for while I was moving, and if I hadn't got a laurel from the first chest, I would have. But I decided they were just that touch too close to XP gems for my liking if I didn't need to risk it. That new one from the blue bat that just dropped at the side of the table though, that looks like one I can safely dash to. Not until I need to though, as, well, as you can see, the purple guys are back. If you were watching my health bar before, you might have noticed that last time the purple guys came, my health dropped pretty low. That's actually the other reason I felt I needed level 4 Laurel. Level 3 only just held them off before, and this time there's going to be more of them over a longer period of time, not to mention they'll start getting pushed in from the outside by bat mobs and the like after not too long. Level 4 Laurel is the one that gives us a second charge, which more than doubles our soaking ability. So, as far as things to help my guy survive long enough to see a few more bosses go, it's pretty much a must-have at this point. Well, unless he wanted to start burning through his revives and just crossing his fingers, I guess. So, Spooky Wheel Guy just dropped his chest in a convenient spot as well, which is nice. I do sort of need a bit of luck at this point, as it's been a pretty bad run in the scheme of things. There's a bunch of chests which we probably can't get, and the ones we have got we haven't lucked into a single triple or quadruple. At this stage, there's really only one more boss we're even waiting on. Then we're going to have to push it and keep picking up chests until we either reach level 6 Laurel, or get unlucky with XP gems and clock over to level 3. So why only one more boss you may ask? So the next boss, the big guy that comes along at 25, 
We'll push through the crowd of beasties, no problem, walk into our bone wall, die, and drop his chest somewhere fairly close to us, almost guaranteed. The last three bosses, though, the Medusas at 26, 27, and 28, they probably won't be able to push through the throng of critters to us. You can see the crazy number of purple guys just starting to come in now at 24 minutes, and yeah, the mobs to deal with only get worse until the 30 minute mark. That means that in all likelihood, they'll just sit around somewhere on the outside, not dying, right up until the reapers appear, where they'll promptly despawn without ever dropping their chests. So yeah, one more chest for us to see, and then we'll have uh, seen all we're going to, and know exactly what it is that we have to work with. It is possible that I'm a little stubborn when playing this game, actually. Looking at this run, I've been cutting it super fine almost the entire time. Only a smidgen off level 3, no decent chests yet, more than a few chests that definitely can't be grabbed at all, health dropping super low before and starting to slowly drop again now as you can see, not to mention my guy's almost completely trapped in. Even if everything were to go smoothly from here on out, there'd still be no real way to enjoy the resulting immortality. Even if he could get completely out of his little alcove, which is not at all guaranteed, there's still almost no space beyond that. He certainly wouldn't be able to go wandering the map with an entourage of reapers in tow anyway, something which I personally find quite satisfying to do. The best he can hope for is to maybe play in the small fight zone below that he tried clearing out initially. Still, that's one of those things I guess. If the run's not a guaranteed failure, then you don't just want to throw away all the time you've invested so far, right? And the further into the run you are, the more that logic holds. Less than 5 minutes left of this run, so it's really not worth restarting now compared to just sticking with it on the off chance of success. Speaking of possible success, it looks like the big 25 minute boss is dead now, although with all the damage numbers from the bones going past as they are, it's difficult to be 100% sure. At this point, I decided to wait just a few more seconds until my health started to get really low, just to make sure that the big guy wasn't still hiding there ready to thwack me on the head as soon as my bone wall was no longer bouncing perfectly. And there goes my health now even. Time to move it. Step, step, step. Just because we're in a rush now doesn't mean we start playing carelessly. So, I can't chest up first. There's nothing we really need or even really want here actually. Duration is nothing special. Next up, our bones already bounce. Plus, even if that choice did affect them, we wouldn't want them going through walls. We like them just the way they are. Critical hits for listed weapons. Again, none of which are bones or lightning which leaves overall area. Doesn't really do much, but at least it has an effect, so I guess that's the one we'll choose. And straight into another chest with a laurel, which is pretty great. Means we only need one more now. Probably the most exciting part of the run when playing, that moment when the end is in sight, but you're still not sure if you're going to make it or not. Will the next chest win it for you? Will the struggle continue? So much anticipation. So with level 5, my health should stabilise a little now. Certainly not enough to hold off till the 30 minute mark, but enough to hold off till the 27 minute mark. One of those things that comes with having done this a few times, I know there's a very small window of opportunity just before the 27 minute mark, where most of these purple guys are dead, but the Medusa Horde isn't quite in full swing. It's not a big window by any stretch, but with multiple chests so close, I figured it might just be big enough. Okay, here comes the first trickle of the Medusa wave, signalling the final moments before the real craziness begins. Time to make our move, now or never. First up, we have the last cooldown reduction book. Nice, but we're not immortal yet. Next up, we have... Ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba! Level 6. And with that, we are now invincible. Not a moment too soon either, as you can see, the screen is now flooded with nasty beasties that we just don't have the damage for. But it doesn't matter, there could be a zillion times that many beasties, all wailing on us at the same time, and it's not going to make even the slightest into our defences. Our very slow amount of health regen is going to take us up to full health now, and that's exactly where it's going to stay. Okay, time for a very quick check of our stats, just for those that want an easy visual guide for what's making our level 2 porter impervious to damage here. Really nothing special, should be exactly what you expect. We have level 6 laurel, and a whole lot of cooldown reduction books. That's it. Anything else we have, or happen to get going forward, is just icing on the cake. Just on a quick side note too, in case you missed it, when this horde of critters came running in, the 26 minute Medusa boss, which was almost right on top of us, got pushed upwards off the top of the screen. We probably won't be seeing her again. Just to highlight why you can't really count on the last three bosses for chest drops when figuring out the details of a run like this. 
it's not guaranteed that you won't be able to kill the bosses and loot their chests, but yeah, it's pretty uncommon. So, if you're wondering, why not go for a stroll now? After all, we don't need the protection of the bone wall anymore, right? What's stopping us? Well, we certainly could, but with so many beasties on the screen, we might accidentally walk over an XP gem we failed to spot, level up, lose our cooldown bonus, which would mean waving goodbye to our invincibility, and yeah, that'd make for a pretty sad end to the run. Also, even if we did manage to avoid all the XP gems on the screen, if we were to wander too far from our spot here, new XP gems might still begin to drop, and again, a potentially tragic end to the run. The hard bit's over and we've made it this far, we can wait another minute or so to see the shield in action against the Reaper, or Reapers even. And once they do arrive, no more XP gems can drop, so then it becomes a lot safer to consider going walkabout for a bit of an explore. I quite like the final minute before the Reapers on these runs actually. If you add up the number of research you have to do just to get a run where you get the right start, like getting a bunch of cooldown tomes to spawn on the map and that kind of thing, then add in the number of runs where you just don't get the drops you need from chests or things just generally go wrong for you, there's a pretty large percentage of times where you don't get to see this final minute of action at all. Okay, so it's just a horde of beasties that are copies of some of the earlier bosses chaotically crowding onto the screen at once, nothing super special in the scheme of things, but yeah, I just find it a nice change of pace. Although, maybe it's just a bit of an association thing? I guess you only get to see this if the run's been successful. Maybe I'd be prone to liking it no matter what was happening on the screen. No way to know for sure, I guess, but whatever the case, yeah, it gets a thumbs up from me. Okay, so here's about the point of the video where people that have skipped through from the beginning to see what the end result looks like will be rejoining us. Thanks to anyone out there that stubbornly sat through me waffling over the top of the run for the last 30 minutes though. I'm still pretty new at making these vids. Hopefully there was at least some info that will help your own runs in the future though. Okay, pop goes the screen. Welcome back to all the fast forwarding viewers. Just in time to see death knocking on our shield, but unable to get through. In previous versions, it was possible to get Reapers caught up on different obstacles like the bookshelves there. Combined with playing a bit of cat and mouse while our shield recharged, it was perfectly feasible to stay alive for a respectable stretch of time that way. As you can see though, they've patched that now. Reapers also used to have a reverse knockback direction, so any weapons that would normally repel critters would actually suck them in towards you. But yeah, as far as I can tell, apart from freezing, it doesn't really matter what's thrown at the Reapers now, they're pretty consistent with their attacks no matter what's around. But yeah, despite the solid attempt at pummeling, our health is staying at full and it's not going anywhere. We could sit here till next Christmas comfortably if we wanted. Well, the game pauses if you alt tab, so we'd have to minimise it and leave it running in the background the whole time, which could get a bit annoying. But yeah, there's nothing in game stopping us from getting the time count as high as we want anyway. I have actually left it for quite a while in the past, just to see if I could get a screen full of Reapers, but their number seems to cap out eventually. I figure there's two possible reasons for this. One is that as more and more crowd into the little area around us, the damage of our lightning, low level as it is, goes up and up, hitting more and more reapers for the same amount of damage, so overall doing more and more, until eventually it's dishing out enough DPS to counteract the hit points of a single reaper a minute being added and a balance is reached. Or two, there's actually a cap on the number of reapers that can be on the screen at any one time, much the same way as there's a cap on the number of XP gems that there can be in an area. This is one of those mysteries that I'll probably never sit down and try to solve myself. If someone out there in internet land does happen to know if there's an inbuilt cap on potential reaper numbers though, please do let me know, yeah? It is something I find myself curious about every time I get to this point. Okay, speaking of this point, we're nearing the end of the vid here. Time to leave people with one last tip for if they're attempting this run, or something similar themselves. Well, I've covered all the specifics in the rest of the vid, nothing big left to cover, but every little bit can help sometimes, right? So, as you can see, my tune here only grabbed the bones from the shopkeeper. Maybe for your run, you'll want to grab all the weaponry though. It does make for a more difficult run, as there are more things from chests that won't be laurels, but maybe you're planning on not missing out on any chests. Maybe even planning on replaying until you get lucky with a few triples or the like as well. It's perfectly possible to get to this stage and also have quite the arsenal of weapons at your tune's disposal. Whatever the case though, the money spent at the shopkeeper each run, multiplied by the number of attempts you put in, can see your gold reserves dwindling pretty fast during this, even though gold isn't exactly hard to come by. One easy trick that takes very little time is to go to the power-up screen and refund all your power-ups. You get back 100% of what you previously spent, you can then buy all the things you're going to use again, but from most expensive to least expensive. As different power-ups have different costs which go up by a percentage when you buy something new, you can actually save a significant amount by simply buying in the right order. 
Okay, it's not a long-term solution, but it does allow you to scrape up the cash for a bunch more runs if you're currently in the zone, so to speak, and don't want to interrupt your rhythm by having to stop and do a couple of gold farming runs. Well, four Reapers on the screen now. I might let it get to five, but I think then that's probably about a wrap for this showcase of how to survive indefinitely. I could leave it going, I guess, but I think I've covered everything pretty thoroughly. It's already been a pretty long vid, and there's really not much of a difference between having an entourage of five and, I don't know, five million Reapers, apart from maybe the extra chaos on the screen. Invincible is invincible, no matter how long the tune sits there. Okay, so like I was saying before, it'll never actually get to five million Reapers, as their numbers seem to plateau out fairly quickly in the scheme of things, but yeah, that's not like you can actually count how many there are at any one time after a certain point anyway. The only reason I'm sure of the number on the screen at the moment even is because we've been watching them add one a minute since they started spawning and none have died yet. If you were to pause the vid and try counting, while it might still be possible to individually make out the outline of all the ones there at the moment, that's certainly not the case after leaving it not very long at all. Anyway, I think that's about it. Hopefully this has been at least somewhat useful for anyone that wants to try some kind of immortal run themselves though. If you've got any questions, do feel free to leave them below and I promise to get to them eventually. And yeah, otherwise, good luck with your own runs. See ya.